Hey there, everyone. This is part two of carving forget-me-nots, or possibly part one, depending on how the editing process goes. <laughs> um, so in the last episode, I added a stencil to the front of our basswood block here and carved out the outline. Uh, there's still some white spots in the middle that I need to carve out. But I think we're gonna start off today with roughing away a bunch of this material around the outside. Uh, this is gonna be a three-dimensional carving, or at least two and a half D. So um, I wanna get a bunch of this material away so we can start to actually shape the, uh, the flowers from underneath. Um, so to do that, uh, I have a couple tools that I want to try. Um, I have a large gouge here, and uh, I'm not really sure how this is going to go. So, start with this, and switch it up, and see how that works. Look at these giant chips. That's working quite well. Let's try going against the grain here and see how that works. Ooh. That is quite satisfying. Experiment a little bit here, see what works best. Ooh, this is not quite as good as the other one. I don't think the bevel one was quite right. Let's try the flat chisel. Seems to work okay with the grain. But I'm a little 
concerned. But I'm going to take off material that I don't want to remove. So let's try this. This split. Fun. So far, the first one I tried, I think is my favorite. Let's try this one. This almost looks like a painter's knife. I don't know what the proper name for it is, but this is like my tried and true favorite from this Hirsch set. I use this thing all the time. This is pretty good. However, I think this right here is our winner. The larger beveled chisel. Originally, I was thinking about having a smooth background to this, but I might actually end up using just like some texture like that. Leave it the way that it is.
We'll see how it goes. I also haven't decided on a stain or leave it just natural colored or whether I should paint this. That, that is still up in the air at this point. This is going much faster than I had expected. Close to the edge, can I go without slipping off? I think I did pretty good there. <laughs> I 
hope you're finding this relaxing. I hope as I'm paring away this wood, slowly unpeeling the layers of stress that you've accumulated throughout the day. And as I go through this process of exposing something beautiful, that you're brought just a little bit closer back to your normal, relaxed self. And if you fall asleep, don't worry. This video is not going anywhere. And I promise I'll let you know when I'm done. stuff you're seeing is just the end sealer on this board that we're gonna have to sand off at some point but at that point is not now so onward I'm getting most of it off First layer, that is. Very interesting texture that this makes. Okay. Put a little bit over here, a little bit there at the ends.
It's time to work on the middle a little bit there. Try and take care of those white spaces. This is going to be tricky. It's just not very much space in there. I think this, can, for the most part, is going to be too big. I have gone around and outlined it, so there really shouldn't be any chipping. But I'm going to go to my, my smallest chisel here. Just work our way in carefully from those outlines, making sure not to chip away our stem. All this small chiseling is pretty quiet, so I figure now is probably a good time to tell a story or two. That way you're not just listening to silence. What I would like to talk about maybe is some of the very first wood carving that I did. When I was young, I was very interested in medieval times. I liked the idea of knights, dragons, castles. I was a big fan of fantasy, Tolkien and the like. And when I was very young, probably too young, I took up wood carving. And at this point, I mean, I was eight, maybe. So really far too young to be using sharp implements while unsupervised. But that didn't really stop me. And with an old kitchen knife, tried sharpen on a rock, I decided I would carve medieval weapons and sell them on the side of the road, like a lemonade stand, except wooden swords. <laughs> um, surprisingly, this was quite a big hit with the kids in the neighborhood. They were far more interested in swords to play with than lemonade after all. And so it did not take me long to make my first sale and then another and another. Now, mind you, these were not like wooden practice swords. 
I was only eight after all. And my skills were self-taught or possibly learned from watching people whittle in the westerns my dad liked to watch. And they weren't the prettiest swords, but they were very, very sharp. Even if they were wood, they were pointy, their edges were sharp, and it did not take long for one of my first customer's parents to come and inquire about how their son had gotten this pointy object for which he was flailing around at other neighborhood kids. My parents put on quite the face of support, which really surprised me. I thought, one, the fact that I had a knife at all to use for carving was going to be my downfall. Um, not to mention the fact that I was essentially an arms dealer, which is something my pacifist parents would not typically approve of. And they didn't. However, as they came upon me being chastised by the other neighborhood parents for selling their children pointy sticks at a price that was rather absurd. I don't remember how much I was selling them for, but I was selling to other young kids who obviously didn't have any real money. And so the funds they used to pay me were likely stolen from their parents' purses. Um, Needless to say, their parents were not happy. And my parents stuck up for me. I think the defense they used was that it was capitalism and that I had found a demand and was supplying it. And I believe they referred to at least one objecting parent as a communist for thinking <laughs> that they should have punished me for it. Of course, when all the other parents had left, I got quite the talking to, and that was the first and last time I ever sold wooden swords. But, it did get me off to a very early start wood carving. And I never did get in trouble for the kitchen knife, for which I had destroyed sharpening on a rock so that I could carve swords. Um, in fact, my mother went out and bought me a proper carving knife, as long as I promised not to carve weapons. I didn't, by the way. That, that was the end of my sword making for a while. I believe from there I went on to build a few wooden castles before discovering video games and losing interest in the outdoors entirely. It wasn't until many, many years later that I took any interest in woodworking of any kind. As a matter of fact, it was after I had, yeah, I guess it was. It was after I had really gotten out of college that things really picked up in that accord. So that's the story of how I got started. I think from then on, the next thing that I tried to carve was actually power carving. Gone to Harbor Freight, which is to this day one of my favorite stores because everything is super, super cheap. 
and they had a attachment for an angle grinder that was similar to a chainsaw blade and was to be used for power carving. So I bought that and I glued a couple two by fours together just to play around with it. And I ended up carving an angel for my grandmother for Christmas. She really likes angels for some reason. And a good chunk of the way through, after removing most of the rough material, I discovered that a five inch round disc is hardly the tool to use for carving fine details in a statue. But I did have a bunch of wood chisels and no shortage of pocket knives. So I ended up finishing the details by hand. And that was quite an enjoyable process. It did spark my interest in carving in general. I've done quite a bit of hand carving since. But it also sparked my interest in power carving. And so I went out and bought a chainsaw, an electric chainsaw from Harbor Freight because it was cheap. And conveniently, this was after a pretty intense windstorm and a huge oak tree had fallen down in my backyard. So naturally, I cut it up into sections. Basically, the largest sections I could keep and still be able to move them myself by rolling them. And I took one of them that I thought was particularly interesting looking and I decided I was going to carve a dragon. Mind you, this is now 20 or so years after my sword carving. Um, and the theme really hasn't changed that much, I guess. The medieval stuff is still kind of entertaining to me. But I just thought a dragon would be a, a generally cool thing to carve. I always saw people carving bears or totem poles, Native Americans, um, the occasional moose or something like that. But most of the time when I saw chainsaw carving, it was kind of the same designs over and over. And I always wondered why that was. I thought it was kind of like a tradition thing, like you carve a bear out of a log and that's just what you do. Occasionally it's an eagle. And that was that. What I came to realize is that the reason people carve those things is because they're pretty easy to carve with a chainsaw. Because they don't have narrow spaces where it's difficult to get the blade around. A dragon with wings and a looping tail is not so easy to get a chainsaw around. Fortunately, I still had that five inch angle grinder disc and was able to get quite far on it. Um, but as I went, it looked less and less like a dragon and more and more like a bat. And the face kind of had this pig-like appearance that was very strange. So I decided that it was going to be a gargoyle instead of a dragon. And I proceeded for quite a while and eventually got sidetracked into other more profitable projects. And kind of forgot about it. But then later I came across it in my shop and thought about starting it up again. So I posted a picture of it on Instagram and universally discovered that I had carved 
Gromit, according to my followers, from Wallace and Gromit. <laughs> so, not a dragon, not a gargoyle, but Gromit. <laughs> and that it actually looked like a pretty good Gromit. Completely by coincidence, mind you. So I did work on it a little bit, and it ended up kind of falling apart. Uh, it was rotten in the middle, and that was kind of the death of that. But the process was quite fun. I thoroughly enjoy chainsaw carving. It's kind of exciting. It's fun because you can remove a massive amount of material very quickly and make fairly large sculptures, um, which is something that really excites me. However, where my shop resides now, I don't really have the space. And even if I did, I think my neighbors would be quite upset with me if I were to take up chainsaw carving because it's a city <laughs> and there's very little privacy and that noise would shake the living rooms of at least 20 people. So for now, it is forget-me-nots and ASMR wood carving, which I hope you're enjoying. I am. And I hope you're also enjoying my rambling, because that is clearly what it is. But hey, I'm not sure if you can hear me actually carving at all with such a small chisel. I wondered that after the first video I made doing this. This is coming along slowly but surely. All these tight spaces I have to be very careful because these stems are pretty narrow. And now that I've roughed out the outside, I don't really have much room to fix them if I break it off. Which means if I do, I will have to glue them back and stop what I'm doing, which I don't want to do. So I am going slowly and cautiously, cutting inwards so that I do not make any scary wood chips. This would be extraordinarily difficult to do if I was using a different type of wood. I've done some carving in like walnut and pine. Both of them, even though they're very different types of wood, have a tendency to chip pretty easily. Where basswood will chip if I push with the grain too much. It really is so easy to cut against the grain that it holds its shape pretty well. I'm actually fairly impressed with this block of wood. I got this as part of a much larger board at the Lee Nielsen Toolworks Open House. I am from Maine, the great state of Maine in the United States. And after quite a few years of woodworking and really just drooling over the hand tools made by Lee Nielsen. I moved to North Carolina, which really only lasted about a year. And to my surprise, there was a Lee Nielsen Toolworks traveling demonstration at a local shared art space. So I went to that. And when I did, I discovered that Lee Nielsen, my highly sought after tool company for which I could not afford any of their tools, but really, really wanted them, was actually based in Maine. And was quite disappointed that I had never actually gone to their Maine headquarters, 
while I had lived there. Well, fortunately enough for me, I did move back to Maine less than a year later, and just in time for their Lee Nielsen Tool Works open house, um, which is quite an event. They have a lobster bake, it's like two days. Some relatively famous woodworkers will go to that. Um, you will see a bunch of YouTubers, people from Fine Woodworking Magazine, Popular Woodworking, that sort of thing. Other tool companies. Um, Lee Nielsen is very generous and they allow people to have booths and sell tools that they do not make at their open house. Um, so there are people selling hand planes right next to Lee Nielsen selling theirs which I think is a really cool thing to do because most companies would not like that kind of uh, stealing of their spotlight. But I think that it leaves such a good mark with the community that it puts a lot of respect on them. And I think that it encourages people to buy their tools regardless. Um, But they have various workshops. Uh, the last year I went to, they had one on social media and showcasing your woodworking, which was quite interesting. It was put on by, I believe, someone who used to be the head of marketing or head of social media for Popular Woodworking Magazine. And in the audience was someone who is relatively famous on Instagram for their woodworking, among other things. And so that was kind of a cool experience to get insight on that. But they also have workshops on how to properly sharpen tools, various styles of cabinetry, choosing the right tools. Um, they have a tour to go see some of the local wildlife and trees and talk about ethical forestry and locally sourcing lumber. But also one of the booths, yes, I'm, I'm getting back to <laughs> the part that I brought this up for, uh, sells a bunch of exotic hardwoods and they actually sell them online for the most part but they had a bunch of different samples there and you know, they had like this really really curly maple various like teaks rosewoods mahoganies all these different awesome looking pieces of lumber and sort of in the bottom corner of their booth in a nondescript area there was a couple pieces of basswood and they were extraordinarily cheap um and so i bought one <laughs> and then i cut this chunk off of it and now i'm carving it i know that was that was a long long way around to get there but that's that's what i was talking about And I'm very glad that I did buy it because it is very well seasoned and it's really a joy to carve. And it makes me wonder if they always sell it so inexpensively. What the heck the name of that company was? <laughs> It'll come to me or maybe they'll be there next year. But yeah, I'm sure I will be there. So this summer, if you are in the New England area and feel like coming to the Lee Nielsen Tool Works open house, you'll probably see me there. So I'm getting sidetracked because I'm just grabbing other tools because I really want to just haul off big pieces of wood here, but I need to finish all these little fine details. I'm going to figure out what I'm going to do for depth on these before I start going too deep. Because
because not all of these flowers are flat, you can see some of these are tend to be kind of at an angle in a three-dimensional way. You may need to go deeper that way. There'll be just a few high points and a few low points. And so today is the, oh gosh, it is the 11th of February. So I am actually sort of running out of time on this as this is intended to be a Valentine's Day gift. So right after I finish filming part two of this series, I will probably be filming part three and part four in rapid succession to try and get it done and then leave the editing for later. Normally, I kind of do a one-to-one -one where I shoot some video, edit some video, back and forth. But the editing is just going to have to wait in this case. This spot is extra small. I'm going to just use the corner of my tiniest chisel just to get this piece out. That is going to get interesting real quick. We'll see how that goes. Might be using an ice pick or something <laughs> to finish that part later. I still really don't know what, what it is that I am making, whether it's just an art piece or if it's going to be part of something functional or what. I hadn't really thought that far ahead. I was just focused mostly on carve some forget-me-nots. And yep, that's, that's about as far as I got in the planning process. As a matter of fact, I went online to get something to use as a template. I think this was probably on the first page of Google. So <laughs> this goes to show I haven't done a tremendous amount of planning for this project. And that is kind of my style. Planning is just not something I typically do. I often find that the best way to avoid being paralyzed by indecision is to just act. Sometimes when you do that, you'll do something you regret. But I find most of the time you kind of just make it work and it doesn't turn out as bad as you would possibly think. After all, the worst case scenario is exactly that. It's just the worst case scenario. And most of the time, that just won't happen, even if you completely throw caution to the wind. Mind you, I'm talking about carving a flower here. If this goes really, really bad, like if I don't get it done <laughs> or just you know accidentally completely destroy it then I guess I'll just have to go out and buy some real flowers <laughs> not the end of the world there are obviously situations in life that have much more serious consequences but even then Things just kind of have a tendency to work out.
keep slowly dragging this closer and closer and closer to me. I don't know if you noticed that. Keep having to remind myself to reset. So I recently purchased a backdrop stand for which I do not have a backdrop yet. But in the future, I'm hoping that I will be able to record some videos from different angles rather than this top down approach. maybe even some different types of content. little middle spots coming along quite nicely. Almost had a bad split there, but miraculously was just exactly what I wanted to take off. I love when that happens. But I guess I need to trace this very carefully before I proceed. By trace, I mean just cut a very deep groove. That way, if it splits, it will stop at that groove where I want the material to be removed anyway. So we're coming up on the hour mark here. So I will probably take a break once we get the rest of this cleaned out. If you are still listening, I am sorry that you are still awake if you were trying to watch this to help you sleep. If not, and you're just enjoying watching this, then that's great. But I'm glad you're enjoying it. This content is whatever you want to make it. That would actually be something really interesting to comment in the description down below. Is this something that you watch to fall asleep? Or is this something that you just enjoy watching to relax? Do you actually enjoy my mumbling conversation? Uh, it would be great to know. And so if you could let me know in the comments, that would be wonderful. That would make my day. If you have any critiques or criticisms, that is absolutely okay too. Or any suggestions for that matter. It would mean a great deal to me if you like this video to hit that like button and subscribe. 
I am pretty new to this. My video editing skills are fairly novice. My recording setup is pretty novice. It is 2019 and I'm using a GoPro Hero 4 camera and a $100 USB microphone, which means that I need to splice the audio together. And it's kind of a, it's kind of a rough operation so far. But if I were to get more subscribers, it would let me know that, hey, this might be something worth investing some better equipment for. And if not, then I'll probably still keep doing this. <laughs> I just won't put the money towards more expensive equipment. Because I really just like wood carving anyway. So if you enjoy it, why not film it? You know, I can make one person's day a little bit better or ease someone's stress, then hey, it's worth it to me. Can you guys see the texture on this? You're just kind of watching a glowing white block getting carved and ships just magically appear. I hope not. I hope my lights aren't too bright. Yeah. We'll find out. After all, this is a learning experience. I've really only made a few videos so far, and I will say that I have learned a great deal. Like, one fascinating thing that I found out fairly recently and embarrassingly recently is you know those those Hollywood things where they put the C number on a board has the black and white lines and they slap it and they say action or cut or whatever. So the reason they do that is so they can time the video and audio because the clap that shutting is easily recognizable and then there is a visual cue to go along with it. On top of that they write the scene information on the sign that they're using that way the editor can look at that and see what stage of the movie they are filming, what scene it is, where it goes in relation to other pieces of film where the audio and video goes, all that information. Just that little simple action. I found that to be quite fascinating. I had no idea. I actually had no idea or any thought as to what they were doing when they did that. It didn't really make much sense to me, but I never really put any effort into figuring it out. Maybe it's embarrassing that I didn't know that. <laughs> But, I'm not really embarrassed about it. I just thought it was a fun factoid. And now I kind of want to build one of those things to use in my own videos. That could be a fun project, right? I mean, it's not really that too terribly complicated. Just like two pieces of wood and a hinge. Maybe some whiteboard to go on the front if I really want to do the full shebang. Maybe I will. Maybe you'll see a video of me doing it on this very channel. Not all of my content is going to be this style of relaxation and ASMR stuff, as I do like doing all sorts of different woodworking and furniture making and stuff. Maybe even some tool reviews. We'll see. Getting close. Almost done with this middle stuff. And I can go back to removing another big chunks of material. But that'll be in the next video. 
depending on when you're watching. <laughs> that one might be out right now too. So if you're interested, you can check that out. This is a good place to stop. All right, folks. I hope you have enjoyed this video. Have a wonderful day. My name is Rick DIY. Please like and subscribe. It would mean a lot to me. And I'll see you in the next video.